Well, today is the day where many people will make resolutions, you know, uh, like New Year's resolutions. And uh, since mine last year was to look at my smartphone more often, um, and and I I accomplished it, um, I found some New Year's resolution tweets that I thought I would share with you. So here's some of my favorite New Year's resolution tweets. January, New Year, New Me, uh, with fruit emojis and exercise emojis, and then March, pizza. Uh, I like this one. I'd love to say new year, new me, but I'm only two stamps away from a free meal with my KFC loyalty card. Would be silly to ruin that now. My 2017 resolution is to work on my low self-esteem, but I don't think I can do it. (laughs) I like that. My favorite part of New Year's Day is writing out my list of new resolutions and realizing it's my list of resolutions from last year. Yeah, absolutely, isn't it? And finally, I know we're all aiming high with New Year's resolutions, but maybe we should just try to keep the inside of the microwave clean first. Uh, It's an accomplishment. Just realized I have a whole year to complete my New Year's resolutions. I'm going to put those washboard abs off till December. So I like that one. That, That may be my favorite. So... Now, many of us make resolutions, but woefully, uh, many of us quit within a few weeks or a month. When we have all kinds of resolutions, like lose weight, maybe stop smoking, hang out with friends more, read the Bible more, uh, work out so many times a week, volunteer at a charity. I mean, we have all these things that we want to do, pay off debt, spend more time with the kids, all really good stuff. But for some reason, we're not able to, to, to pull all that together. Um, in fact, a lot of times we make resolutions, it just adds more and more to our plate, and then we end up stressing out more, and then the new year isn't so fun anymore. Um, I was working out uh, this summer with a Chris, a guy that attends our church, and we were working out, and I don't even know how New Year's came up, because uh, it was August, but New Year's came up, and he goes, you know what I'm going to resolve to do? He goes, I'm going to resolve in 2018 to do less. Uh, he said, you ought to preach on that, do less. And uh, I, it got the wheels turning. Chris is a great guy. He he's, uh, works a full-time job, owns several businesses, um, is really engaged with his extended family and encouraging and supporting them. And he's, a real, he's also really engaged with his wife and his kids. And, but he's got lots going on. And, and it just occurred to him that, that maybe he should resolve to do less in order to actually um, do more, to have more impact. That got me thinking. You know, as human beings, all of us get kudos from doing more, don't we? Like, we just get kudos from that, you know. Uh, Take on more projects at work, uh, regardless if they benefit you or the company. Just take them on, you know. Um, We get in more hobbies. We put our kids, if you have kids, more and more stuff they're involved in. It just, we get something out of of doing more. And so we continue to be tempted to, to pack our lives. But it can be pretty overwhelming, all these packed lives that we have. It's overwhelming because we we pack our lives with so much stuff and then we put pressure on ourselves to achieve. This this can be really prevalent in in religious people's lives. I mean, just think about it. If, If we get kudos from doing more and more things in our lives, if you then put God's stamp on it, then we get even more kudos, right? And so as religious folks, we can just continue to add more and more religious activities to our lives. We just, I mean... If we struggle with, you know, getting our kudos because we accomplish something at home, like uh, we install a dishwasher or we make a repair, or, man, if you do something ministry-wise and you think that God is for it, then it really gets to us and, and we just begin to add more and more religious lives. The problem is there are many, many worthwhile activities that I think God would want us to be involved in. Think, I wrote a list out here. Small group, church services, volunteering, sharing our faith, Bible study, mission trips, prayer, discipling others, healing the sick, reading spiritual books, helping the elderly, taking a class, giving to the poor. Whew, I'm tired just reading the list. Uh, there's like a lot to do. How in the world could we ever decide which activities should be the most important? Now, this was actually something that, that people in Jesus' day debated. There were these guys called scribes. They were like religious lawyers. And what they would do is they would help weigh God's commands in the Old Testament and say which ones are heavy and which ones are light, meaning these are really the core. They summarize God's or God's uh, word or command. You ought to really do this, or these are lighter. If, if you flub on these, ah, but to get these ones right. They also, these scribes would go around, there were 613 Old Testament laws, 365 
prohibitions, like don't do this, and there were 248 do this, like positive things, make sure to do this. And what these scribes would do is they would try to think of every conceivable um, situation you could find yourself in life, and then they would try to interpret all of those out and say, okay, here's how you obey this command in this circumstance. And it was very complex, very burdensome, I mean, let, you, you, can't, you can't memorize 613 commands, right? That'd be tough right off the bat. But now you had to try to memorize all the interpretations for every circumstance you would ever come across. Well, one of these scribes comes up to Jesus, and he sees that Jesus has been tested by other scribes and passes all the tests, and he has great answers. And so he comes and asks Jesus, like, what is the most important thing you could do? Now, you may be wondering, what does this have to do with New Year's resolutions? Well, my guess is, is you're all here in church because you want to become better people, right? I mean, that's part of it. I mean, you come to worship God and, and give your life to God, but part of the worship is you're wanting to be transformed and, and be a better person. We study the Bible because of that. We pray, we attend church, we make commitments, spiritual commitments. We make New Year's resolutions even because we want to become better people. But what if we're missing out on the most important thing that God wants us to do? Or the really core thing that God wants us to do. I mean, what if the secret isn't doing more things? What if the secret is, is actually doing less in order to do more? To be more impactful. To be more God-honoring. Even to have more of a fulfilled life that you know, yeah, I'm, I'm in the will of God. I'm where he wants. What if the secret isn't doing more? What if the secret is like actually doing or focusing on less and then out of that, we'll actually do more for God than we ever would by adding more and more activities to our lives. Well, that's a premise I think Jesus makes in several, several places. And probably the clearest place is, is Mark 12. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Mark 12. And we're going to come across that scribe I was telling you about that he wants Jesus. He's not trying to test him. He actually looks at Jesus quite favorably. We see that from the, the sentences in the beginning of the story and at the end of the story. Today we're going to read half of the story. We're going to complete the story next week. But we're going to look at this scribe and he comes to Jesus and he says, what's the most important thing? Of all the commands that we could obey from God, what should we be focusing on? And it doesn't necessarily mean important as far as qualitative, like, like this command of God beats this command of God. I mean, I'm guessing if God said to do something, it's all important, you know? But I think it was more of what summarizes, what's the core of it? What command kind of summarizes all of them that you could hang all the other commands on? And so Jesus answers that. We're starting a three-week short series today called Resolution Revolution, Resolving to Do Less So You Can Do More. How can we do less, focus on less, so that we can actually accomplish more in 2018? What does God want the priority to be? Take a look at, at Mark 12, verse 28, 29. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, Jesus and some other scribes. Noticing that Jesus had given a good answer, he asked him, of all the commands, which is the most important? The most important one, Jesus said, is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, he hasn't answered the question completely yet. He's going to give the most important command here in a second. But I want to pause here because it's kind of interesting what Jesus says right on the front end of this thing. The scribes ask, and of all that we could do, of, of, that God wants us to do, what sums it up? What's the core? What, what can we hang all the other commands on? What's at the center of it? Now, maybe he's asking because um, he's in the midst of a, of a debate we know was going on in Jesus' time of, of between the scribes of what the heavy laws are, what the light laws are. Maybe like humans, I mean, I think all of us as humans who pursue God, we want to know, like, we want targets to hit. And sometimes we want targets to hit in a good motivation, like I want to please God. Um, if you're a cred ball like me, then I want targets to hit because uh, then it's something I can achieve. And then I can go, see, me and God are good because I did this. He said, do this, I did this. Now don't look over here of all the other things I didn't do that, that he said, but, you know, I did this. So maybe he's asking for that, for human achievement. I don't know. I think he's asking for the right, right motivation. 
But it's interesting, when Jesus answers the question, what's the most important thing, instead of going right to the command, and he's, he's pulling this out of, out of Deuteronomy 6 and also Leviticus 19, um, he, Jesus says, he's pulling these scriptures out, he starts with the front end before we get to the commands. He says, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You say, why is that important? Why would Jesus start with that? Why didn't he just tell us what to do? Come on, Jesus, we just want to know what to do. We want to know what target to hit. I think Jesus wants to remind us that whatever we're going to do needs to be motivated by who God is and what he's done. This, This phrase is called the Shema. You may have heard of the Shema before. It's just the Hebrew word that means hear or listen, and it's named that because of of the first line there, hear, Israel. And if you know anything about Jewish people, especially strict Jewish people, they always have this verse on them. They have these things called phylacteries, and they would, they, would, they would write the verse down, roll it up, put it in a little box, and they would hang it, um, like on a necklace, or have it sewn into their clothing. Sometimes the real strict ones would tie it around their head and have the box right here. Every good Jew would have it at their doorpost, so that every time they left their house and every time they went into their house, they could touch that, or, and it would remind them, our God's different. Our God's unique. Like, there's all kinds of gods competing for us, isn't there? Beauty, wealth, comfort, hobbies, entertainment, nationalism. There's just all these things trying to pull for us. Education, career. I mean, a lot of these things, good things, right? But yet, we twist them and we try to get our kudos from them. And we serve them more than we serve God. And as Jesus said, you can't have two masters. There's all these things pulling at us. And yet every one of those things compared to God is a, is a puny God, right? Every one of them compared to our God. Because our God is unique. He is one. He has created the world. For, for every Jew, when they would think of this scripture, what they would think of is that this was said during the time period after Israel had been rescued from slavery, the Egyptians, and miraculously sustained in a desert for 40 years as they journeyed to the promised land. It would remind them of God's covenantal love, that our God is not only unique and almighty and all-knowing and all-powerful, but our God is a God of love, covenantal love who rescues his people. Whatever Jesus is about to say is the most important thing we could be doing. However we're going to try to do it should be motivated by this, that our God is love, and he has rescued us. He is holy, and he is powerful, and our whole being has been permeated by his love. He wants to love on us and pour his love on us to immense degrees, and that should motivate us to do whatever Jesus is about to say were to do. It reminds me of the hymn writer Isaac Watts and his song, Wondrous Cross. There's a couple verses in, there's that line, it just says, uh, love so amazing, so divine. Isn't that amazing? This incredible God of the universe and all that he sees and all the screwy stuff we do, he's chosen to love you. Isn't that amazing? loves you. And you. And you. He loves you. I mean, this, this God, the Almighty, put your head around that. He loves you. And you. And you. And you. And you. Just think of that. He loves you. Whatever Jesus is about to say should be motivated that our God is not only all-powerful, he has rescued us and demonstrated incredible love for us. Now, verse 30, we're ready for that. Here's what Jesus says is the thing that we should focus on. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and all your strength. Boil it all down. Try to figure out what to focus on. God, what is your priority that you want from us? And it's unconditionally love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, 
with all your strength. Jesus didn't need to repeat your, did he? In fact, in the original language there, there's actually a you in the beginning of the verse. You love the Lord your God. Very personal. If you're going to get anything right, if you're going to focus on one thing, if you're going to make a resolution, Jesus is saying, focus on this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. He is the one who has rescued you. He is the one that has poured out his covenantal love, his love that will never leave you. Allow his love to permeate all of your being. And because your whole being is permeated with his love, you love him back with your whole being. Corey Tim Boone, the great evangelist, post-World War II, post-concentration camp, loved to say this, God has no grandchildren, only children. And what she meant was, you can't have a relationship with God vicariously through your parents. If your parents are believers, you, you don't get to have a relationship to God through them. Or if your best friend, or if your pastor, your small group leaders following you, you don't get to have one. What God is looking for is you love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength and all your soul. It's personal. It's personal. Because the God of the universe has poured his love out on your person. He loves you. And the more you allow him to permeate you with his love, then the more you can react back to him personally by loving him. Love so amazing, so divine. Now, how does God expect us to love him? Again, Jesus repeats some words that are unnecessary. He could have just said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? But did you notice another word there that's repeated a whole lot? The word all. He, did, he, he makes a point of adding the repetition, all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, all your soul. Why? Because he wants us to get it. That this love we're to have for God is to be all-encompassing. All means all. It's the same word we get holistic from. It's to be this complete love. Now what I'm about to say may be the most revolutionary thing I'll say today. So if you've already checked out, check back in and you can check back out when I'm done with this sentence. All right? Okay? So here we go. I was reading this article this week by a pastor of discipleship out of uh, Illinois. His name's Greg Oden. And... Um, Greg said this, he said, one day, he goes, I always read this verse and felt bad afterwards because I know, these are my words, uh, I knew what kind of a crud ball I was. Like, I know what's in here. When he says, love him with all my heart, I know my heart. I know what I think about. I know what's at the core of my being. I know what I do with the powers, whether it's physical or mental or, or uh, influence positions I have. I mean, I know what I do with that. And he says, love God with all? I don't know about you, but I would always kind of read this verse, and here's, here's where I'd be at, and I'll, I'll get on with what Greg said. But I would read it, and if I got real close, I could see some other words in there, like there's a missing verse, and it says something along the lines of, Boys, I know this is just idealism and you'll never get it right, but try your best. You ever see that verse in the Bible? <laughs> you know, I, I see that like a lot. The thing that Greg said that I read in an article this week that hit me, and I stood stunned, and I even teared up, and maybe it won't hit you as how it hit me, but it hit me as he said, one day the Spirit of God spoke to his heart and said, This is possible. I sat in the conference room and just cried. I said, oh, Jesus, that's, that's what I want. I want to know it's possible. That with my whole heart, my whole mind, and my whole soul, and my whole strength, I could love you. We would probably never answer this consciously, but I think we do it all the time subconsciously. We think Jesus just says this stuff not expecting us to do it. 
But the reality is he says the stuff in here because he actually believes it's attainable. I mean, he says heal the sick. He actually has some expectations we could do that. When he says make disciples of all nations, he actually thinks we could do that. When he says things like forgive, he believes we could. When he says love your enemies, that's not just like a nice thought. You know, it's not, he's trying to not do some oprification of things and, you know, like, oh, there's a warm fuzzy. He like, means like we could actually love our enemies, right? He actually remain, means that. I think this is actually possible. That we could become the kind of people who actually love God with our whole being. Well, how would you do that, Joel, you might say? How would that even happen? I think Jesus tells us that too, in this passage even. He already started by saying that we're permeated with the love of God. When he says that verse of hero Israel, he's taking them back to their history in Deuteronomy 6, that that was when we were rescued by God. And even though we rebelled against God, he poured out his covenantal love on us, miraculously sustained us in a desert, miraculously helped us as slaves to defeat the army of Pharaoh, which was not by warfare, but by God's intervention. They know that they have been permeated by the love of God, their whole being has been permeated with the love of God and then he says this is what God wants in response you love unconditionally you unconditionally love your God with it's one of the times where one little word really helps because the word with right there is the word out of or from the source of to love God with all your heart means Love him out of your heart, that place that's been permeated by the love of God. And love him with all your mind. Your mind has been permeated by the love of God, and so love him back with that love. Your body has been, has been your strength. And the word strength doesn't just mean physical body. It means any area of power in your life, whether it's your position at work or position in your family or an influence you have with a neighbor, whatever, your beauty, your wealth, whatever kind of power you have or strength in your life. That's been permeated or supposed to be permeated with the love of God. So love him back with that in your soul. That part of you that's immaterial that makes you you. Like that part of you, if it would leave your body, you'd just be a shell. We've all seen shells, right, at, at funeral homes. And we know they're not really there because their soul isn't there. That place has been loved on by the love of God. And from that place, love him with everything you've got as your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength are permeated with the love of God you are enabled to love God with all your heart all your soul all your mind and all your strength Jesus says if you're going to be focused on one thing make one resolution then it would be this be permeated with the love of God and then love him back with all that you have God has already been completely devoted to you, so be completely devoted to God. Since your whole person has been incredibly loved on by God, we're to love him back with our whole person. Now, I mean those in quite literal terms. Notice I didn't say try to love God. Reminds me of a quote from, from Dallas Willard. He, he said once, he said, God doesn't say try to love him or try to worship him. He just says love him or worship him. And he said the problem with most of us as Christians, and he goes on to say that the, the reason you will see ministers and their families fall apart or break down is because they spend too much time trying to love God and they can't uphold the burden of trying and putting on the act. Like what God wants is us to actually be permeated by his love and actually really love him back with everything we've got. Not try not act, but actually experience his love. And then out of that place, love him back. God's love, so amazing, so divine. If you remember the other, the ending of that verse that Isaac Watts wrote, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Get it? You just get overwhelmed by his love. And after that, it becomes quite natural to love him back. The secret is to allow yourself to be loved on by God and to have more revelation of his love permeating your being and then love him back with all that you've got. 
Being permeated by God's love is adequate enough to empower us to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my all. Here is our resolution revolution. Let's resolve this year to allow our whole selves to be fully and wholly loved by God so that we can love God back with our whole selves. Resolve to be loved by God with all that he has for you and then resolve to love him back with all of you. Allow your whole being to be permeated by his love and then respond to him with love. My prayer is that this happens to you today, supernaturally, that you bring your whole life, your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole strength, and totally surrender it to God and say, God, love every bit of me that you can, and he will. Reminded of John Wesley, the man that started the great Methodist movement. And he and a group of friends got together and started praying. It turned into a 24-hour prayer meeting because the love of God fell on their little group in their little living room. And he said at one point, he said it just felt like love was kind of in a liquid form, just washing all over him. And he said, I had to pray at one time, God, stop loving me right now because I think I'll die if you love me anymore. It was the power of God on him and the love of God. My prayer for everyone in the room is that you'd experience the love of God that way. The core of your being. It wouldn't be just a concept, but your heart, the center of your will and emotions, that you would experience the love of God and with your will and emotions you would choose to love him back. That your mind, your, your thoughts would be permeated by the love of God and you would love him back with that love. Your body, you would even feel him in your strength, that you would feel the love of God in your body and you'd say, with whatever power, or position, or strength I have in life, I'll love you back with the soul. I pray the core of your being right now be infused and permeated by the love of God. And if that happens, you unconditionally loving your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength and all your soul will come right quite naturally. It's really not hard to love God with everything when your everything's been loved on by God. It's just not that hard. Like what else are you gonna do? I mean, a God of the universe pours his love out on you. It's like, I got to love him back, right? So two things perhaps to help. Two quick things. One, I, do, I want to do an exercise. Uh, to, I think I can, I, can, I can probably demonstrate it more than explain it. So would you just close your eyes and let's ask the Holy Spirit to come. And I pray this exercise could be something you could practice perhaps even this week. Now, Holy Spirit, would you come and sanctify our thoughts and imagination? We, we just would confess we use our thoughts so often for all kinds of goofy stuff. Um, sometimes sinful, sometimes just meaningless. But would you use it? We, we set it aside and say, use it for your good right now. I pray right now that you would help us to imagine a picture for the feelings of our heart. Show us a picture of how our heart is loving you right now. Holy Spirit, would you give us a color for our soul in regards to how the core of our being, what makes us us, how it is loving you right now. And Lord, show us something of depth that would reveal how deep our thoughts are in regards to loving you. If we have very few thoughts about you throughout the day, then that depth is probably pretty shallow. If if we're constantly thinking about you, then that depth is probably pretty deep. Show us how deep our thought life runs when it comes to loving you.
Would you show us a picture of strength? How strong is our love for you? How are our bodies, our positions of power or influence, how are we loving you? Show us a picture of strength or weakness, how we're loving you. You may not have gotten all those. I'm doing it quicker than I normally would, but perhaps you got one of those things. If you got all four, that's great. But in your imagination, which I think is just simply your image station, it's quite real. Bring whatever picture or color that God gave you. Bring it before God and say, God, would you permeate this with your love right now? Permeate my heart. And this picture you gave of my heart, permeate that with your love right now. Permeate my whole heart because I want to love you with my whole heart back. Here's my soul. And here's the color you gave me. Would you permeate my whole soul, the very core of my being? What makes me me? Would you just begin to lavish me with your love right now? And ravage my mind with your thoughts. Would you just come and take my thoughts and permeate my thoughts with you and your love? And my body and any area of strength in my life, whether it's influence among friends or family or work or my beauty or my wealth or whatever area of power or strength in your life. Jesus, we bring that before you. And would you just bathe even our physical bodies, even right now, we would begin to sense the immense love of God. Just come. Allow him to come and love on you right where you're at. I'll give you about 15 to 30 seconds just to rest and keep bringing those areas before him in your imagination and allowing him to love on you. got that prayer exercise from some Catholic brothers and sisters and what if this week we simply started our day with that kind of an imaginative prayer and ended our day with that that we would a be taking inventory of where we're at in our heart soul mind and strength but then we would just be holding them out saying God love on me be a good practice our resolution revolution is actually to resolve to do less so we could do more to Allow our whole selves to be wholly loved by God so we could love him back with our whole selves. One other thing you might find helpful is uh, Israel's kind of preeminent worshiper and their king during their golden age, King David, knew one of the biggest secrets of loving God was to love him with our minds, to center on them. He said this, I have set the Lord continually before me, meaning in my mind, 
Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, my glory rejoices, my flesh also will dwell securely. And so a practice, if you're wanting to practice this week to make the thing that Jesus said is the most important thing we could be doing, if you want to take him seriously and actually begin to doing it, one of the practices you could do is to try to set your mind on Christ as much as possible. Have your thoughts centered on. I think on the slide I suggested you could memorize a verse about God's love, like 1 John 3, 1, I think. You know, how great is the love of God that he's lavished on us, that we are called children of God, and that is indeed who we are. The world does not know it because it has not been made known to them yet. You know, so you could memorize that. If you're not good at memorization, you could write it on a piece of paper or carry it around. Or This morning as I was praying about this sermon, I thought, you know, one thing, if you're not good at, at, at memorization, what if you just wrote a little piece of paper? I just, this could be like your fortune. You know, it's a little fortune thing. Um, on one side, what if you just put love so amazing, so divine? And on the other side, you just put demands, my life, my love, my all. And you just carry that around and you begin to center your thoughts throughout the day. Every time you feel everything, love so amazing, so divine. And allow your heart to be permeated by the love of God in that brief moment. Demands my love, my life, my all. Just practice centering on God, allowing him to love you so you can love him back. That's our resolution revolution is to focus on what Jesus would have us focus on, which is to allow ourselves to be wholly loved by God so we can wholly love him back. I want to close with a story before ministry time, and we'll wrap up here. In his book, Furious Longing of God, Brennan Manning tells a story um, about Don Quixote, and he bases it off the musical, if you've ever seen the musical, The Man of La Mancha. And um, I actually watched the movie. There's a movie version of the musical from 1972 with Peter O'Toole and, and uh, Sophia Loren. And so if you're familiar with the story, Don Quixote is a guy that thinks he's a knight, right? And he goes off to fight giants, which are actually windmills. And um, everybody thinks he's crazy and yet the more you go through the movie or the more you go through the book and the story or the musical, you realize that, um, uh, that Don Quixote knows more about the world than everybody that thinks he's insane, you know, that he has more of a grip on reality than they do. Here's part of the story. He goes to an inn and he meets the kitchen maid who is also a prostitute. Her name is Aldanza. She slept with every man in the inn and the nearby prison, sometimes for money, sometimes for just sheer pleasure. And as a result, she has lost every shred of self-respect. She's filled with overwhelming guilt and self-hatred because of her promiscuous lifestyle. And then one day comes along Don Quixote, striding utterly unselfishly into her life. He befriends her and begins to woo her by infusing into her a sense of dignity, worth, and purpose. All his efforts are in vain. She hates him the more that he speaks kindly to her. She rebuffs him at every turn. Still, he pursues her over and over again. And he calls her by a, a, a Latin name called Dulcinea, which just means my sweet little one. At other times, he calls her my lady to give her a sense of aristocratic um, bearing. Now realize in the movie, she's completely, hair is all a mess, she's dirty, her clothes are torn. Uh, in, in the book, in the musical, she's with different men. I mean, she's on the outside, anything but the things that he calls her. Here's how he describes her. He says, her name is Dulcinea, her country El Tabaso, a village of La Mancha. Her rank must be at least that of a princess. She is my queen and my lady. Her beauty is superhuman. Since all the impossible and fanciful attributes of beauty which the poets apply to their ladies are verified in her. Her hair is as gold. Her, her forehead like the fields. Her eyebrows are rainbows. Her eyes have healing and they shine like the sun. Her cheeks are roses, her lips are coral, her teeth are pearls, her neck is alabaster, her hands are ivory, her fairness the snow. And what modesty conceals from such sight, I think and imagine, as rational reflection can only extol and not compare. One day he calls out to her with both names, Dulcinea, my lady. She rips off her apron 
and comes storming into the room, seething with contempt, and she begins a litany of self-hatred and condemnation, a once and for all attempt to distance herself from any notion that she's a lady or a a sweet little child. I'll paraphrase her speech for you. She says she was abandoned by her mother after less than a desirable birth. She said if she had any ladies since, she would have given up and died right there in the ditch, but she didn't. She said a a lady would gladly point to her father, but with a sweeping arm of shame, she says, she'd have to include the men of the entire regiment of the army as her father because her mom was with so many men and she doesn't know who her father is. She says ladies see themselves in their father's eyes, but she sees nothing because she doesn't even know who her father is. A delicate birth would have dictated an upright life, but much of her time is spent flat on her back, the kitchen whore men casually use and then discard. She rails at Don Quixote to see her as she really is, not the lady of his dreams. She has learned to live a life of harsh realities, life as it is. She survives by taking and then dishing it back. His eyes, clouded with what she could be, actually drives her to despair. She says, blows and abuse I can take and give back again, but tenderness I cannot bear. Her speech concludes with her vision of herself. And in the book, in the movie, she just simply says, I'm just a whore. But again and again, Don Quixote keeps returning. And in spite of all the appearances of the contrary, he sees what is true and good and beautiful in Aldonanza, Aldonza. And slowly, from the way she sees herself reflected back to her in the eyes of the old knight Don Quixote, she begins to remember who God had created her to be. And slowly, that other Don Quixote, Jesus Christ, begins to stride in front of her and says, the past is over, the healing is done. We all stumble on the way to maturity. We all look for love in the wrong arms, happiness in the wrong places, but out of it you have become real. You've got a heart of immense compassion for the brokenness of others. You are utterly incapable of hypocrisy and I am deeply in love with you. If you ever get to see the musical version in real life, there's a powerful moment when Aldanza leaves the stage and walks into the audience. And to the first row, she proudly announces, from this day forward, my name is no longer Aldanza. I am Dulcinea. How would you describe what happens to a woman like that in that moment? The words we might use is that she is born again, renewed, refreshed, reborn, healed by the loving touch of Don Quixote's furious love. God loves you just as you are, not as you should be, but the God of the universe also sees who you really are. And beyond all the dirt and all the crud in your and I's heart, he looks past that and he calls out the gold in us. And he loves us with an all-permeating love. And the more of us who are Aldanzas allow our lives to be spoken to by the love of God and permeated the love of God, we, like Aldanza, will begin to actually believe the reflection we see in Jesus' eyes of what he believes and loves about us. That we are Dulcinea. We are sweet little child of God. Children of God. Completely loved by him. And the more we allow ourselves to be loved wholly by him, then our whole selves quite naturally will love him back. Let's take a few moments for ministry. Come Holy Spirit. This come. There are there are Aldanzas in the room. 
people who read a scripture like love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength that simply can't get it because they've never allowed themselves to be fully loved by God. And they have good hearts who long to please God and they come across verses like this and they're tripped up and they fall into self-condemnation and self-hatred. And what Jesus is saying first is remember this, God's people, the Lord your God is one and he is the deliverer who has come to you with covenantal love that he so loved you that he gave his only son that he demonstrated his love for you first by dying on the cross for you and giving Christ up for And what he asks before you even try to obey and practice this verse is that you would allow your Aldonza self to be loved on by the God of the universe. So now in the name of Jesus, may you be loved on by the love of God. As we sang earlier, may your soul be awakened in this moment for the love of God. Just right where you're at, I'll be quiet as Phil plays here. I'll...